Warning, not appropriate for all audiences. This program includes adult content, descriptions of sex acts, and extremely graphic violence. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hi, I'm Brian Newberry with Project Wasabi. What you're about to hear is a chronological sequence of events leading up to the slaughter of 30-year-old Travis Victor Alexander. Whenever possible, I have cited specific names, locations, dates, sources, and included exact details. However, some of this timeline is based on my casual observations of websites, TV reports, and the hearsay of unverified sources. The Jody Arias Timeline is presented without any guarantee of accuracy, relevance, or completeness of information. Without further ado, here now is the Jody Arias Timeline. July 28, 1977. Travis Alexander is born in Riverside, California. His parents are crystal meth addicts, and Travis and his siblings are adopted by their grandmother, Norma Jean Preston Alexander Sarvey, who baptizes the children into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. July 9, 1980. Jodi Ann Arias is born in Salinas, California and grows up with her parents in Northern California and Oregon. 1986. When she's six years old, Jody hits her younger brother Carl in the head with a baseball bat. Babysitter Beth Hawkins recalls Jody as, quote, an exceptionally aggressive child, unquote. While babysitting, Beth cannot leave the two children alone without some sort of violent or destructive event happening. Jody's troubled teenage years. Summer, 1994. 14-year-old Jody routinely fights with her parents. She shoves her mother Sandy, kicks her, and on at least one occasion, Jody actually punches her own mother in the face. August, 1994. Sandy discovers her 8th grade daughter Jody is using her Tupperware to grow marijuana on the roof of their home. Understandably concerned, the parents, Sandy and Bill, call the Sheriff's Department, who immediately book Jody and two of her friends. After that, her father Bill says, it was like something turned in her head. She hid everything from us and always has since then, and she's never been honest with us since then. In the months that follow, Jody becomes even more secretive, alienating her parents, barely speaking to them. Bachelor number one, enter Bobby Juarez. August 1995. While at a carnival with friends, 15-year-old Jody meets 18-year-old Bobby Juarez for the first time. Unemployed and on crutches, Bobby Juarez has long, dark, curly hair, and Jody says he has a, quote, 18th-century goth kind of look, unquote, and he really likes video games. In Wairika's triple-digit temperatures, Bobby wears a high-collar white shirt under heavy, dark clothing. They begin talking. Jody is intrigued by this man, and the two become friends. January 1996. According to Jody Arias, this is when she and Bobby Juarez begin dating officially as boyfriend and girlfriend. When she's 15 years old, Bobby Juarez wants to get married, move to San Francisco, and hunt vampires. But Jody, still a freshman in high school, sees this as unrealistic and, quote, too intense, unquote. So she breaks up with Bobby. Bobby Juarez is physically abusive, including chokeholds, arm locks, and threats to Jody's family. According to Jody Arias, Bobby is so distraught by the breakup, he tries to kill himself by slitting his wrists. Arias claims Bobby is committed to, quote, some kind of psychiatric ward in Citrus Heights just north of Sacramento, unquote. Jody travels to Costa Rica for the month of August to study Spanish on a student exchange program. While in Costa Rica, she has a brief romance with a local teenager named Victor Arias. No relation. Victor gives Jody a promise ring and tells her he wants to start a family with her. When Jody returns home from Costa Rica, she and Victor maintain a long distance relationship, but shortly thereafter, Jody says Victor is too possessive and she breaks up with him. September 1997. While waiting tables at her parents' restaurant, Jody claims she often sees a man in his 60s or 70s who carries a heavily annotated pocket Bible and frequently quotes scripture. According to Jody Arias, the man tells her that, quote, he's done the math in the Bible, unquote, 
and the second coming will occur on September 23, 1997. Jody claims that at that time in her life, she is naive and fully believes the man. Because Bobby Juarez, according to Jody, is, quote, uncertain about his spirituality, unquote. Jody, who identifies herself as a non-denominational Christian, thinks it important that Bobby hear this information about the Second Coming so he can make a decision for himself. And together again, as the Second Coming draws nigh, Jody and Bobby rekindle their romance and begin dating anew. April 1998. Not for the first time, Jody's father Bill catches his 11th grade daughter ditching school and he grounds her. Jody, now 17 years of age, reacts by dropping out of high school, leaving home, and moving in with her now 20-year-old boyfriend, Bobby Juarez. Still unemployed, Juarez is now living in Oregon with his new roommate, Matt McCartney. When Jody moves in, she provides financial support for the three of them by working as a waitress at their local Denny's. August 1998. According to Jody Arias, she sneaks into Bobby's email account and discovers Bobby is exchanging love letters with another woman and Jody breaks up with Bobby. Bachelor number two. Enter Matt McCartney. January 1999. Jody starts dating Bobby's roommate, Matt McCartney. January 2000. Jody and her boyfriend, Matt McCartney, moves to Wairika, California, and get a one-bedroom apartment, just the two of them. July 9, 2001. Jody celebrates her 21st birthday. August 2001. Jody claims that while she's working at Applebee's in Wairika, two women who are customers tell Jody that her boyfriend, Matt McCartney, is secretly romancing another woman named Bianca. When her shift is over, Jody makes a 70 mile drive north to Bianca's dormitory in Crater Lake, Oregon. On her arrival at the dormitory, Jody asks a mutual friend, Steve, for Bianca's room number. According to Arias, Steve appears, quote, frantic, unquote, and intentionally gives Jody the wrong number. But Jody soon figures out the correct room number and knocks on Bianca's door. Bianca opens the door, the two speak briefly, and confirm, yes, Bianca and Matt are indeed having a relationship. Instead of driving all the way home, Jody spends the night with her nearby friend, Eddie Lee. And in the months that follow, although they're not a romantic couple, Jody and Matt McCartney remain friends with benefits. Early 2002, both make their way south, seeking work in Central California's lucrative tourist industry. At the Ventana Inn and Spa in Big Sur, California, Jody is interviewed by Daryl Brewer. The food and beverage manager is duly impressed by this young woman, and he hires Jody immediately. Matt McCartney gets hired a few days later. Like most employees at the Ventana, Jody and Matt live in tents on designated campsites owned and operated by the resort. Jody and Matt continue their relationship as friends with benefits. Bachelor number three. Enter Daryl Brewer. Late 2002. Jody begins dating her manager, Daryl Brewer. Accordingly, Daryl Brewer says this is the time when he decides to, quote, step out of his management position, unquote, and the 42-year-old divorcee takes a position as event coordinator, no longer Jody's supervisor, so that the two can date romantically. Late 2002, Brewer's son, Jack, is three years old. January 2003. After attending a San Francisco 49ers game, Daryl Brewer and Jody spend the night together. The two fall in love, taking their relationship to a more serious level. Brewer describes Jody's sexual appetite as, quote, aggressive and enthusiastic, unquote. Brewer says they're both very comfortable with their intimacy. May 2005. Jody moves to Palm Desert, California. Together with her boyfriend, Daryl, Jody buys a house in Palm Desert, California, about 100 miles east of L.A., and the two agree to split all the costs 50-50. At the time they purchase the house, Brewer is living off his savings while he seeks employment as Jody waits tables at a California pizza kitchen. Jody's parents, Bill and Sandy, ask if they can make the trip down and visit, see Jody's new home. Her father, Bill Arias, recalls Jody as saying, Where are you going to stay? I don't want you staying here, snooping through our stuff. February 2006, Jody begins work with prepaid legal services, now Legal Shield. Her boss is a man named Dr. David Hughes. 
April 2006, Daryl Brewer notices changes in Jody's behavior. He says she seems like a different person. May 2006, Jody gets breast augmentation surgery in La Jolla, California. June 2006, as Daryl Brewer puts it, quote, taking her spirituality more seriously, unquote, Jody converts to Mormonism, and Mormon men soon begin showing up for weekly Bible study. Jody abstains from sex and insists Daryl Brewer stop using profanity. Jody and Daryl Brewer no longer sleep together, and their relationship fizzles to an end. August 2006. Even though she's still working with prepaid legal services, Jody stops paying her share of the household bills. September 2006. Enter Travis Alexander. Jody attends a prepaid legal services work conference at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a professional event, but the general mood is festive, lively people having fun. During a break, Jody steps outside the main entrance of Rainforest Cafe. At a distance, she sees her immediate supervisor, Dr. David Hughes, call out to another man. Hey, Travis, there's someone I want you to meet. She notices her boss is pointing at her. As Travis Alexander walks right up to Jody, extends his hand, and introduces himself. There's immediate chemistry, and throughout the next 48 hours, the two spend most of their free time together. Travis is not only smitten with the 26-year-old beauty, but he's also interested in converting Jody to the Mormon faith. As the prepaid legal work conference comes to an end, the attractive young professionals exchange contact information and promise to stay in touch. With Jody living in Palm Desert, California, and Travis living nearly 300 miles away in Mesa, Arizona, the two begin long-distance dating via email and phone. They meet up in various locations between and around their separate homes. October 1st, 2006. After seeing Jody's MySpace page, which involves witchcraft, Travis's friend Jacob Mefford gets a bad feeling and warns Travis this girl is really creepy and to stay away from Jody. October 15, 2006. Travis purchases the book 1,000 Places to See Before You Die. Using this book as a guide, the young couple spend the next few months traveling to, or meeting up at, various romantic vacation spots, including places like Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, the Albuquerque Balloon Races, Carlsbad Canyon, and Disneyland. November 1, 2006. In Palm Desert, California, Jody Arias stops paying her share of the mortgage. November 26, 2006. Jody Arias is baptized into the Latter-day Saint faith by Travis Alexander. When out with Travis's friends, Jody's public displays of affection are becoming more and more inappropriate. Some of Travis's friends feel uncomfortable. Jody licks his ear, kisses his neck, massages his back, and generally hangs all over Travis. December 2006, Jody's ex-boyfriend Daryl Brewer moves back to Monterey, California, as Jody continues to live in the Palm Desert house, even though she's not paying the mortgage or the monthly bills. Daryl Brewer remains friends with Jody, mostly over the phone and through email. During this time, Jody briefly begins dating Abe Abdelhadi. She and Abdelhadi had seen each other at work functions and had lunch together. Now in December, they enjoy dinner in Pasadena, walk around some, and go to the Barnes & Noble bookseller on Colorado Boulevard. Meanwhile, in Arizona, most of Travis's friends agree Jody is bad news. Not only how she acts with Travis, but also how she's secretive and unsociable with the women, and flirts provocatively with the men, many of whom are married. Not surprisingly, there is a common sense of disdain against Jody, especially among the women. February 2007. According to Jody, she and Travis begin to date exclusively, and they begin having sex. March 2007. Jody Arias and Travis Alexander visit several states together, including New York, Oklahoma, and Texas. This is according to Jody Arias. On one of their many getaways, as is their usual habit, they rent a car. When she gets behind the wheel, Travis starts ribbing her because Jody has positioned the rear view mirror so that she can see a clear view of herself as opposed to the traffic behind them. Travis sees Jody as a great girl, but she's a little more possessive than Travis likes, and she's not always completely honest. 
but the sex is wild and insane and incredible. One weekend, Travis's good friends Chris and Sky Hughes invite Travis and Jody to spend the weekend at their home in Murrieta, California. Later that night, after Jody has gone to bed, Chris and Sky Hughes take their friend Travis aside and tell him to be very careful around Jody. They share their worries with Travis, and to their surprise, suddenly discover Jody standing right outside the door, listening in on their conversation. Jody is furious, well, pissed, and everyone feels awkward. Chris Hughes describes her face as looking like the devil, way spooky. After that uncomfortable experience, Chris Hughes tells Travis that Jody is no longer welcome in his home. The couple both encourage Travis to distance himself from Jody. April 2007. Travis's friends say Jody keeps trying to isolate Travis from his usual group of friends. May 2007. One weekend, friends Jacob and Holly Mefford are visiting the home of their friends Chris and Sky Hughes in Murrieta, California. Suddenly, and without knocking, Jody walks into the house unannounced. Jody asks Sky Hughes why she and all the other women hate Jody. And in no uncertain terms, a furious Sky Hughes gives Jody a comprehensive list outlining what they do not like about her. Sky adds that Jody is not welcome in her home and that Jody is to, quote, leave now, unquote, and do not come back. An hour later, while Holly Mefford is making macaroni and cheese, Jody walks into the kitchen, sits down at the dining room table, and just stares at Holly for 15 minutes. June 29, 2007. While Travis is in the shower, Jody surreptitiously opens his cell phone and begins spying for text messages from other women. After all the other problems with Jody, this cell phone spying is the last straw, and Travis Alexander breaks off the relationship, telling Jody they should both start seeing other people. Approaching his 30th birthday, Travis Alexander makes it common knowledge among his friends and family, as well as Jody Arias, that he's focusing his sights on finding a more traditional Mormon wife. Alexander's friend, Dave Hall, remembers Travis as saying, quote, There's nothing about her that I see in marriage material or wife material. Unquote. July 9th, 2007. Shortly after Travis tries to end the relationship, Jody Arias abandons her home in Palm Desert, California, and relocates to Mesa, Arizona, about three miles from Travis's home. Once settled in, Jody tries to get work waiting tables and modeling. Despite no longer being exclusive, Travis accepts Jody's recurring offers of no-string sex, and the two slip into a discreet, indeed secret, role of friends with benefits. Mid-July 2007. Travis goes out to his car one morning to find all four tires have been slashed. Some of Travis's friends suspect his ex-girlfriend from Palm Desert, California, and many agree Jody is stalking Travis. And, of course, the fact Travis and Jody sometimes have consensual sex only complicates issues. Jody repeatedly enters Travis's home unannounced without his knowledge, sometimes by crawling through the doggy door. July 20th, 2007. 29-year-old Travis Alexander begins dating 18-year-old Lisa Andrews. It's currently July 2007, and the two date on and off through the following February 2008. The young singles seem to be on different frequencies. Travis wants to marry, but Lisa's not ready yet. Travis has been thinking about sex since the moment they started dating, and she tells him he needs to be patient, and he'll get his turn someday. Their makeout sessions are lasting longer than they should, inciting their passions. Lisa accepts her responsibility and says they must behave more responsibly. In an email to Travis, Lisa says he wants her just for her body. Her kisses mean nothing. She feels it's a way for Travis to let out his sexual tension he has so much of, and it makes Lisa Andrews feel used and dirty. Although frustrated by Lisa's reluctance, Travis acknowledges her comments, telling the 18-year-old he will respect her wishes, and in the following week, Lisa does see genuine and positive change in how Travis treats her. Lisa says Travis is never abusive nor aggressive with her, nor disrespectful in any way. Always a gentleman, Travis is more easygoing, but he does have a few words he dislikes. According to Lisa Andrews, per Travis's request, she will refrain from using the words poop, crap, and fart. 
July 23rd, 2007. Travis is away on a business trip with prepaid legal. With both his roommates out, Travis asks his former girlfriend, Deanna Reed, to go to his house, about an hour's drive, and check in on Napoleon the dog. In a short time, Deanna pulls into Travis's otherwise vacant driveway. Unlocking the door, she walks in and immediately smells fresh-baked cookies. Bewildered, Deanna sees Jody sitting on the couch with Travis's laptop. Getting up from the couch, Jody carries a tray of cooling cookies to Deanna and invites her to have one. July 25, 2007. After his date with Lisa Andrews and successfully suppressing his sexual urges, he drives the young lady home, walks her to the door, and gives her a respectful goodnight kiss. Lisa is beautiful and sweet, and she smells wonderful. Travis is so aroused he can barely see straight. Returning home at about 10 p.m., Travis feeds Napoleon the dog, then retires upstairs to his master suite. He opens his closet door and finds Jody inside. Travis is perplexed and angry by this invasion of his privacy. What if his roommates had been home? Before he can say anything, Jody crouches in front of Travis, being careful not to kneel on his toes, and Jody ingratiates herself. And with very few other actual words spoken, Travis invites Jody to stay the night. When interviewed later, Travis's friend Taylor Cyril explains, quote, Jody represented the decision of going after someone he's physically attracted to, whereas some other girls represented settling down, having a nice, stereotypical Mormon relationship. And I knew he always struggled with that fork in the road. Should I date Jody, or should I go with these other girls? Unquote. August 2007. Sitting on his couch in the living room of his Mesa, Arizona home, Travis Alexander is making out with his girlfriend, Lisa Andrews, Lisa takes off her bra and things are heating up like Mexican salsa. The two become happily lost in each other's wild passions, driven to distraction and sensual rhythmic harmony. Staring intently into his eyes, Lisa is electric. He inhales Lisa's perfume and exhales a sigh of bliss. The night is fantastic. The young Mormons both see hope. The two see their spiritual potential both now and in the future. They see Jody. Standing in the backyard, staring at them through the window, Lisa screams shit and hurriedly puts her bra back on, as Jody runs back to her car, gets in, and drives off. A few days later, one of Travis's former roommates, John Pepworth, tells Lisa Andrews that Travis is cheating on her with Jody, and as a result, Lisa Andrews and Travis Alexander temporarily break up. August 2nd, 2007, 8 a.m. Jody makes the following journal entry. Quote, I love him, though I could not possibly love him not, though I wish I could stop, turn it off like a light switch, duct tape it down so it can't turn back on, or better yet, just cut the circuit, cut off its life source, make it dead in a second, lifeless, a meaningless network of wires that do and mean nothing. Unquote. August 4th, 2007. That night, while Travis is standing with Lisa Andrews in her kitchen, Jody Arias walks into Lisa's house unannounced and without knocking. When Jody sees Travis and Lisa in the kitchen, Jody turns heel and runs out the door. September 2007. Once lived in by Jody and Daryl Brewer, the Palm Desert house goes into foreclosure. December 2007. In Mesa, Arizona, Travis Alexander's tires are slashed. Travis gets new tires, which also get slashed. Travis jokes that either there are more potholes in Mesa, or he's being stalked. December 25, 2007. Travis visits his brother Stephen and his family on Christmas Day. The proud father hands his little infant daughter to Travis, so he can hold his baby niece for the very first time. With hope in his eyes, Travis tells his brother, She is the most beautiful little girl I have ever seen. Hugged, kissed, and loved by family. Travis returns to his home in Mesa, unlocks the front door and walks in, and is surprised to find Jody under his Christmas tree. And this time, Travis tells Jody she needs to leave. While out on a date, Travis and Lisa Andrews notice Jody is following them, and in the next two days, Lisa Andrews receives threatening email and text messages. January 22, 2008. According to Jody Arias' sworn testimony, this was the date when Arias claims to have seen Travis Alexander masturbating to a photo of a little boy. Arias further testifies that on this date, January 22, 2008, 
Travis kicks Jody, breaking her finger. However, two days later, January 24, 2008, on this date, Arias writes in her journal, quote, I haven't written anything because there hasn't been anything noteworthy to report, unquote. She also writes she turned down four offers for a date. February 11, 2008. After visiting with Travis in his home, Lisa Andrews returns to her car in the driveway, disappointed when she sees her tires are all slashed. February 2008. Travis Alexander and Lisa Andrews break up permanently as romantic partners, but do remain good friends. February 29, 2008. Marie Mimi Hall says she and Travis both start dating very briefly. One night, Jody is spying on Travis and sees him leave his house to go on a date with Marie. When Jody is certain the roommates are gone, she enters Travis's home by crawling in through Napoleon's doggy door. When Travis returns home from his date with Marie, he finds Jody sleeping on his couch. Once again, Travis yields to temptation. They have sex, and Jody spends the night in his bed. The next morning, Jody promises this will be their dirty little secret. Later, in her sworn testimony, Marie Mimi Hall says Travis was very sweet and respectful and, quote, a very nice guy, unquote. But Marie Hall never felt a romantic chemistry, and the two remained friends until Travis's death. April 2008. Enter Ryan Burns. While Travis and Jody are both attending a prepaid legal convention in Oklahoma, Jody meets associate Ryan Burns for the first time. Ryan is a handsome, young, successful Mormon who lives in West Jordan, Utah, just south of Salt Lake City. Jody is smitten. Smiling, she tells Ryan Burns, quote, If you ever need assistance from out in California, you're welcome to call me, unquote. For whatever reason, Ryan does not call Jody. Their mutual friend, Zion Lovinger, receives a phone call from Jody. She asks Zion as a favor. Next time he sees Ryan Burns, could he please put in a good word for Jody? April 2008. Scheduled to speak in Phoenix, Travis goes out to his car to find, yet again, all four tires slashed. Though she denies any involvement, at this time, Jody tells Travis she is going to kill herself. Worried she's serious, Travis cancels his speaking engagement. April 16, 2008. Travis Alexander writes the following blog post. This year will be the best year of my life. This is the year that will eclipse all others. I will earn more, learn more, travel more, serve more, love more, give more, and be more than all the other years of my life combined. True, other years now past have been at times magnificent, but none like this. This is a year of metamorphosis, of growth and accomplishment that at previous was unimaginable. A year where the impossible becomes commonplace and the unachievable become effortlessly achieved where I raise myself to heights only visited by the great men and women of this world, and by so doing, this year will be the best year of my life." Unquote. April 20th, 2008. Early morning, about 3 a.m., sound asleep alone in his bed, Travis is suddenly awakened by the sound of a vacuum cleaner. He gets up and walks downstairs to find Jody vacuuming his carpet. April 24, 2008, Jody moves out of her residence in Mesa, Arizona. Returning to Wairika, California, about a thousand miles north, Jody moves in with her grandparents. Travis helps Jody pay for her move. He is extremely happy to be rid of Jody. May 2, 2008, 800 miles east of Wairika, California, two friends are playing pool somewhere in Salt Lake City, Utah. Zion Lovinger and Ryan Burns have spent the past two days preparing for tomorrow's business conference thrown by prepaid legal services. Lovinger says to his friend, Oh, so do you know a woman out in California named Jody Arias? Yeah, Ryan Brightens. I met her a few weeks ago at a convention. She's beautiful. As the two men play pool, Zion encourages his friend to call Jody. According to Ryan Burns, quote, Zion maybe played matchmaker a little bit, and we talked about it and then I ended up giving Jody a call that night." Unquote. 8.15 p.m. When her cell phone rings, Jody takes the call. Jody, hi, this is Ryan Burns, he says. We met at the convention last month in Oklahoma. Do you remember me? Yes, Jody beams. I was just thinking about you. For the next 45 minutes, Ryan and Jody have a pleasant conversation. 
A romance begins to spark as the two begin calling each other three to five times a week, usually 10 or 11 at night at the end of their day. Throughout this time, when she's around Travis and his circle of friends, Jody's mood swings become increasingly volatile. She follows Travis, calling and texting him while he's out on dates. While he may have had doubts before, Travis is now thinking it was Jody who slashed his tires. Early May 2008. Jody has phone sex with Travis, which, unbeknownst to him, she is secretly recording. The two are talking dirty, and in the heat of the moment, Travis says that when Jody moans, she sounds like a 12-year-old girl having her first orgasm. Jody asks Travis to repeat himself, and he does. Jody giggles and says, that's debasing, I like it. And at that, Jody does her very best to moan like a 12-year-old girl. At some point shortly thereafter, Travis finally cuts ties with Jody completely and wants nothing to do with her. No sex, nothing. Editor's note. I think Jody is using this sex tape to blackmail Travis. If Jody sends this tape to Travis's peers from church, it would be devastating for Travis in terms of spirituality, business, social, personal, all levels. Jody sends increasingly hateful text messages to any of the women she sees Travis dating or talking to. In her text messages, Jody calls them whores and says they don't deserve Travis. May 19, 2008. In an instant message conversation, Travis tells his friend Reagan Housley that he is extremely afraid of Jody because of her stalking behavior. Meanwhile, Jody and her new boyfriend, Ryan Burns, have phone sex, and their emails become increasingly sexual in nature. May 26, 2008. In a series of text messages, Travis finally tells Jody, quote, To you, I am nothing more than a dildo with a heartbeat. You are a sociopath. You are the worst thing that ever happened to me. Unquote. 6 p.m. Jody calls former boyfriend Matt McCartney in Monterey, California. She'll be in town this Monday night. Is it okay if she spends the night at his place? Sure, Matt says. I'll call you when I get there, says Jody. 10.30 p.m. During one of their late night phone calls, Jody tells her new boyfriend, Ryan Burns, she wants to come meet him in person. And without hesitation, Ryan Burns sends Jody his home address in West Jordan, Utah, with driving directions on how to get there. She tells Ryan she's going on a long road trip down to L.A. to visit a friend who's recently had a baby. Jody will then take Interstate 15 north to Utah, and if all goes well, she should arrive at Ryan's home on Wednesday, June 4th, around noontime. May 28, 2008. Arius repeatedly calls ex-boyfriend Daryl Brewer, asking to borrow his two five-gallon gas cans. What do you need them for? Brewer asks. Agitated, Jody refuses to answer his question. Preparation for murder. Wednesday, May 28, 2008. A burglary occurs at the residence of Jody's grandparents, with whom Jody is now living in Northern California in the small town of Wairika. Items stolen include a 25 caliber semi-automatic Colt pistol, as well as some stereo money and two other objects. A total of four items are taken, one item from each of the four rooms in the house. Although nothing is proven, many suspect it was Jody who stole these items, and this is most likely the same 25 caliber auto she will later use to shoot Travis in the head. May 30th, 2008. Just after midnight at 12.21 a.m., Jody sends her first Gmail chat message to Ryan Burns. Jody's message reads, Hey there, handsome. This is a test. June 1st, 2008. Sunday. Again, Jody calls ex-boyfriend Daryl Brewer in Monterey. Again, Brewer asks her why she needs these gas cans. This time, Jody tells Daryl she's going on a long road trip. Brewer tells Jody she can borrow the two gas cans. Jody tells Brewer, quote, I'll be at your place tomorrow, or Tuesday, unquote. A thousand miles away, Travis Alexander tells friends he suspects Jody Arias has hacked into his Facebook and bank accounts. Travis texts Jody to stay out of his life forever. 10.30 p.m. Jody is exchanging text messages with Ryan Burns when she spins her own version about an instance in which she intercepted a text message on Travis's cell phone from a woman addressed to Travis. She replied to the text message impersonating Travis as Jody tells Ryan Burns in her text, quote, 
The whole time we were seeing each other after we broke up, he had another girlfriend. And I had no idea. He didn't tell me about her until after they broke up. But I felt so bad. This time, I was the other girl. I wanted to tell her, but that would have just caused a lot of unnecessary drama. Anyway, since she asked what time it was, I decided to text her back. It's time to cuddle with Jody. Good night. Unquote. June 2nd, 2008. Monday. 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. Seven calls between Jody Arias and Travis Alexander. Editor's note. We don't know what was said during these phone calls. For example, did Travis invite Jody? Or did Travis say, stop calling me, stay away? 8.15 a.m. In Redding, California, about 90 miles south of her home in Wairika, Jody rents a white Ford Focus. The car rental agent, Rafael Colombo, later recalls Jody being with a man. He is certain Jody's hair was blonde. She is, quote, very pleasant, unquote, had called in to reserve the car. Jody refuses a red car, telling Colombo she wants a lighter car so as not to draw attention to herself. When the car rental agent asks Jody how far she'll be driving, she says, just local, around town. Jody drives south. 7.30 a.m. In Lodi, California, Jody stops at McDonald's and gets an order of fries and a bottled water. She calls her former boyfriend, Matt McCartney, in Monterey, saying she'll be at his place later that night. And at 10 p.m., Jody arrives in Monterey and spends the night with Matt McCartney. June 3rd, 2008, Tuesday, 7.40 a.m. Jody leaves Matt McCartney's house and drives to the home of another ex-boyfriend, Daryl Brewer, now living in Pacific Grove, California, on the outskirts of Monterey. During this morning's visit, Brewer loans Jody two five-gallon gas cans for her, quote, long road trip, unquote. She tells Brewer that while she's in Los Angeles, she'll be visiting with Brewer's sister, Laura Mahoney, who's just recently given birth. Jody and Daryl Brewer have breakfast together in his home, and Jody uses Brewer's computer to check her email and her MySpace accounts. 10 a.m. Jody says goodbye to Daryl Brewer and drives into downtown Monterey, where she deposits $800 into three different bank accounts at Washington Mutual. Deposits are in the amounts of $400, $300, and $100. Editor's note. These are even dollar amounts, all in increments of 20. I think Jody got these cash payments from her boyfriends, McCartney and Brewer, possibly in exchange for sex, possibly just thinking they were being good guys. 10.30 a.m. Somewhere between Monterey and Salinas, California, Jody finds a public restroom and changes her hair color. 12.25 and 1.40 p.m. After making two calls to Travis Alexander, Jody drives to the next town, Salinas, California. 2.25 p.m. Jody parks at the Walmart in Salinas and, while sitting in her rented Ford Focus, she takes a picture of herself showing she has dyed her hair dark brown, or brunette. She takes another picture of herself at 2.28 p.m. She then goes into Walmart to get some supplies. 3.22 p.m. At the Salinas Walmart, Jody purchases one five-gallon gas can. Add that to the other two she borrowed from Daryl Brewer. She also buys sunblock and facial cleanser. 3.30 p.m. Continuing south, Jody gets on the 101 freeway, then Interstate 5, transfers to the 210 south, and gets to Pasadena just after 8.30 p.m. 8.35 p.m. Jody stops at a Starbucks in Pasadena, uses the restroom, and gets a strawberry frappuccino. While in Pasadena, Jody stops at Walmart where she gasses up her rental car. She also puts extra gas into the three gas cans. Her receipt is timestamped 8.42 p.m. She calls Travis, who hangs up on her. She calls him again, and they speak for 10 minutes. 9 p.m. Using her Helio cell phone, Jody calls her new boyfriend, Ryan Burns. She gives Ryan her itinerary, telling him she'll be in Utah at his place tomorrow, Wednesday, between 12 noon and 1 p.m., even though she knows she will not be making this meeting. Burns tells her to be careful driving in the desert through the night. He tells Jody to pull over and rest if necessary. On the phone, Jody gives a kiss, bids Ryan good night, and ends the call. She then unplugs the cell phone from the charging cable, removes its battery, and puts everything in the glove compartment. Jody gets back on the road, connects to Interstate 10, and drives east toward Mesa, Arizona. Editor's note. Just like most states, California requires vehicles have license plates on both front and rear of vehicles. However, 
Arizona only requires the rear license plate. June 4th, 2008, Wednesday, 1 a.m. When she crosses the border driving into Arizona, Jody pulls into the Flying J Travel Plaza, which is a full-service 24-hour truck stop located just inside Arizona, less than a mile from its border. While at the Flying J truck stop, Jody removes the front license plate and tosses it in the back seat. She buys a bottled water, gets back in her car, and continues east toward Mesa, Arizona. Editor's note, this Flying J visit is speculation on my part, but with good reason. According to police timeline, Jody arrived at Travis Alexander's house just before 4 a.m., which means, based on distance, we can infer Jody crossed the border three hours earlier at 1 a.m. It's the middle of the desert, pitch black of night, and this is the most visible place around guaranteed to have a restroom and bottled water. Speculating, I think it's very likely she stopped here at 1 a.m., bought some water, and also gassed up her car using her gas cans. Jody gets back on the road, connects to Interstate 10, and drives east toward Mesa, Arizona. 3.55 a.m. Arriving at Travis Alexander's house, Jody backs into the driveway. She gets out of the car, but before going inside the house, she takes a screwdriver behind the car, removes the rear license plate, and reattaches it upside down. She opens the trunk, puts the screwdriver in her backpack where there's already the stolen pistol. She zips her backpack shut, throws it in the trunk, then closes her trunk with a thud. Travis opens the front door, then raises an index finger to pursed lips, shushing Jody because it's early, and his two roommates, Enrique Cortez and Zach Billings, are still asleep. Unbeknownst to Travis, just by their mere presence in the house, his two roommates have bought the ill-fated Mormon a 13-hour stay of execution. Jody and Travis are both tired, so Travis takes her back to his bedroom, where the two sleep until about 1 p.m. 12 noon. Jody is sleeping with Travis in his bed. Meanwhile, 600 miles north in Utah, Ryan Burns is sitting in his kitchen, expecting to see Jody pull up in his driveway any minute now. He's looking forward to taking Jody to a training seminar tonight at 7. Burns calls Jody's cell phone, which is turned off, and his call goes directly to voicemail. 1 p.m. At Travis's home in Mesa, Arizona, Travis and Jody awake and engage in lively sex play. With roommate Zach Billings still in the house, for privacy, Travis shuts and locks his bedroom door. Jody's cell phone is still turned off, so when Ryan Burns calls, once again he's sent directly to voicemail. Later, according to his subsequent testimony, Ryan Burns sits in his kitchen thinking, hmm, I hope she's okay. 1.45 p.m. In Travis Alexander's bedroom, he and Jody are taking intimate pictures of each other in the nude. The pictures clearly indicate Travis and Jody are both willing, consenting participants, and very much into it. The pictures are up close and personal. Think Hustler magazine with poor lighting. 4 p.m. Ryan Burns has still heard nothing from Jody. Hundreds of miles of desert. It's summer. She's been up all night. He can't get through to her. She hasn't called. Ryan calls their mutual friend, Leslie Udi explains the situation and asks Leslie if she can try to get a hold of Jody. Meanwhile, inside Travis's house, roommate Zach Billings leaves to go to work, and with that, Jody and Travis are now completely alone in the house. 5.15 p.m. Dressed in the bathrobe, Travis enters the bathroom, turns on the shower, and waits for the water to heat up. Jody puts on a pink sweatshirt, blue yoga pants, and sneakers. She runs downstairs to make sure all the roommates are gone. She runs out to her rented Ford Focus and retrieves her backpack, concealing the 25 caliber pistol she stole from her grandparents' house in Wairika. 5.20 p.m. In the upstairs bathroom, the water is now hot. Travis disrobes and steps into the shower. Meanwhile, Jody locks all the doors and gets two large knives from the kitchen. Before heading back upstairs, she secures the doggy gate at the foot of the stairway to block Napoleon the dog from possibly coming up to protect his master. Once upstairs, Jody enters Travis's walk-in closet where she opens her backpack and takes out the pistol. Next, she takes a kitchen knife and slides it through the back of her waistband against the small of her back. Looking up, she notices Travis's brand new Sony camera on the top shelf. Helping herself, she takes it down and becomes momentarily intrigued by the timer function. Cool. What follows is a scenario based on Prosecutor Juan Martinez's closing statement. Jody enters the bathroom. 
she starts taking a series of time-stamped pictures of Travis while he's taking a shower. 5.29 p.m. Jody tells Travis to sit down in the shower and look straight into the camera. He complies, and she snaps the picture. Adjusting her yoga pants, she feels the knife's handle just above the small of her back. Editor's note. I believe Travis is sitting down in both pictures, and the second picture of his butt and legs was taken accidentally. These are the last pictures of Travis while he is still alive. Jody stands over him. They're totally alone. Confused, Travis smiles. What? Jody's eyes brighten, framing a cute, perky smile. Okay, now close your eyes and count to ten. She giggles. And don't open them. Promise. 5.31 p.m. As Travis closes his eyes, Jody pulls the knife out of her belt. She takes a deep breath, leans in close, and abruptly shoves her knife deep into his chest, instantly puncturing a dime-sized hole in his heart's superior vena cava. Involuntarily, Travis screams while suddenly hemorrhaging from his fatal chest wound. And without proper medical attention, Travis's death is now imminent within minutes. Trembling in terror, he reaches up trying to grab the knife away from Jody. In a moment of chaos, fingers and hands entwine. Jody inadvertently cuts her own finger and she screams, furious. Regaining hold of the knife, she thrusts it again, this time into the top of Travis's thumb. Jody looks at the deep cuts to her own fingers as Travis, coughing on his own blood, crawls out of the shower and stumbles to the bathroom mirror. Standing over the sink, Travis is now coughing and streaming blood into the counter. As he looks in the mirror, he can see Jody behind him, as if using an aerobic machine at the gym. She is pumping the knife fast up and down into the top of his back, and at some point, the knife gets stuck. Travis, exhausted, drops to his knees. Bracing her foot against his left shoulder, Jody grabs the knife and pulls, yanks, keeps pulling, until the knife comes loose out of his back. Wheezing through a mist of his own blood, Travis stands, and Jody stabs him again in the back of his neck, and again twice in the back of his head. She thrusts the knife with so much force, the blade gouges out small pieces of bone, or divots, from his skull. Editor's note. What must Travis be thinking at this point? Maybe Jody's lost her mind. She doesn't recognize me. Whatever she thinks, I ain't sticking around to find out. I'll get in the car, lock myself in, drive to the hospital, maybe a fire station. Pain searing through his body. Travis makes his way down the hallway, trying to get to the perceived safety of the stairway. But Jody falls on him like a swarm of angry hornets. She taunts him, punches him, kicks in his knees and ankles. His back to the wall, Travis is crying frantically, begging for his life, and trying to defend himself en route to the stairs. When Jody goes for his face, Travis raises both hands to block, and Jody thrusts the knife deep into his palm, near the thumb of his left hand. Falling to the ground, Travis continues crawling toward the stairs in an attempt to flee. Naked, terrified, disoriented, and hemorrhaging fatally, Travis nears the top of the stairway where he is kicked hard in the face. He collapses in a heap as Jody begins stomping on his head repeatedly. Kneeling on Travis's back, she pins him down, grabs him by his eyes and nose, yanks his head back, then slits Travis's throat from ear to ear. Jody begins repeatedly sawing back and forth, back and forth, she cuts through the cartilage, severs the windpipe, and continues sawing back and forth, almost to the spinal column, nearly decapitating Travis. Now drowning in his own blood and fluids, Travis falls limp. Jody drops the knife and shakes her hands free of blood. Travis has stopped moving. When she's certain he's not getting up, Jody begins dragging the limp body back to the bathroom. Her feet slush through an inch of water, blood, and other fluids. According to Prosecutor Juan Martinez, this is about the time as she's dragging his body down the hallway when his heart finally stops pumping blood and Travis Alexander is now dead. Jody drags the body into the bathroom, stops near the sink, then shoots Travis in the head through his right temple. Three more minutes of morbid work on Jody's part, and Travis is now in the fetal position on the floor of his shower. 5.40 p.m. A few moments to catch a breath, and Jody begins to clean up the mess. She deletes the incriminating pictures on his camera, and to better cover her tracks, Jody drops the camera, smart card and all, into the house's washing machine, tosses in a load of Travis's clothes, adds some bleach, does a load of laundry. Jody cleans the blood off her own clothes and body as best she can. She treats the cuts on her fingers and covers them with adhesive bandages. Jody leaves Travis's house, locking the door behind her. She begins driving north on the next leg of her road trip, 
Salt Lake City to make her date, although not on time, with Ryan Burns. 6.15 p.m. Not long after Jody makes her getaway, Travis's roommate Enrique Cortez comes home from work. According to Cortez, quote, yeah, things looked kind of weird and out of place, unquote. He says the doggy gate is locked, blocking the staircase, keeping Napoleon the dog downstairs. 7 p.m. 600 miles north in the town of Sandy, Utah, just south of Salt Lake City. The prepaid legal business briefing is about to get started. Ryan Burns, Leslie Udi, and other associates are in attendance. But no Jody Arias? 9 p.m. Down in Mesa, Arizona at Travis's house, roommate Zach Billings returns home from work, completely unaware Travis's corpse is upstairs in the bathroom shower. 9.30 p.m. It's been about four hours since Jody butchered Travis in his bathroom, and now she's heading north on Highway 93. In the black of night, somewhere near the Nevada border, Jody throws the 25 caliber automatic pistol and the two knives somewhere into the vast open desert. As of December 3rd, 2018, these murder weapons have never been found. Meanwhile, about 400 miles north in Sandy, Utah, the prepaid legal business briefing concludes. And just like they do every week, Ryan Burns, Leslie Udi, and a bunch of co-workers go for drinks and appetizers at the Cheesecake Factory in Murray, Utah. This is according to Ryan Burns' sworn testimony on the witness stand. 10.30 p.m. At the Cheesecake Factory, Ryan's cell phone rings. Caller ID shows it's Jody Arias. Ryan looks at his friends and says, Jody Arias, I'll be right back. He steps outside. Where are you? He asks. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, Jody says, chuckling. I am so unbelievably airheaded. I got the wrong freeway. I was heading the wrong direction for hours. And then I got tired, so like a good girl, I pulled over, locked all my doors, and fell asleep. And oh my God, I can't believe how long I slept. I'm glad you're okay, Ryan says. I couldn't get through to your phone. Yeah, Jody says. I forgot to pack my charger before I left, and my phone's been dead all day. I just bought another one at the gas station a few miles back. I, I didn't realize that the... <laughs> Never mind. Ryan's concern starts to subside. Well, where are you right now, Jody? You want me to come get you? You know, Jody says casually, I still don't know for sure where I am exactly, but I'll call you when I get close to West Jordan. I've got so much to tell you. The two talk for about half an hour longer. 11 p.m. At a roadside rest stop somewhere in Nevada on Interstate 15, Jody ends her call with Ryan Burns and makes three brief phone calls, leaving messages on Travis Alexander's voicemail. Enter bachelor number four, Jody's Utah alibi, Ryan Burns. The following is based on Ryan Burns' sworn testimony. June 5th, 2008, Thursday, 10.30 a.m. Sitting in his kitchen in West Jordan, Utah, Ryan Burns smiles, relieved, when Jody finally pulls into his driveway. As he walks out to greet her, the two exchange hugs and hellos. Pointing at two small bandages on Jody's fingers, Ryan winces. Whoa, what'd you do, cut your fingers? Oh, yeah. Actually, I attend bar at Margaritaville, and a few days ago I broke a glass. Flirtatiously, Jody points to the bandages. I cut right along here and right here. But Ryan grimaces. Ouch! He takes her hand and kisses the bandages. Listen, I've got a sit down with a client at 12.30. You want to come with? Of course, Jody tosses her hair. Where is it? Jim's Restaurant's about a mile down the road, Ryan says. And do I have time to change? In about 45 minutes, Jody has showered, touched up her makeup, and changed into heels and professional clothes. 12 noon. Driving his own car, Ryan Burns pulls out of his driveway, with Jody driving her rented Ford Focus following behind him. 12.03 p.m. According to Ryan Burns, about 700 yards into their drive. Jody is pulled over by West Jordan police officer Michael Gallietti. Seeing this in his rearview mirror, Ryan also pulls his car over and watches from about 30 feet in front. On separate occasions, Ryan and Officer Gallietti agree the front license plate of Jody's rental car is missing, and the reason Jody was pulled over is because her rear plate is upside down. Police Officer Gallietti lets Jody Arias off with a warning and Ryan Burns helps her reinstall the license plates correctly, right side up. 12.15 p.m. Ryan and Jody arrive at Jim's restaurant and meet with Ryan's prospective client. After wrapping up the meeting, 
Ryan and Jody stay a while and talk. And after some friendly back and forth, Ryan says to her, So, how did your license plates get all goofed up? Jody shakes her head with a laugh. I wondered what those kids were doing. The story she tells Ryan, and retold in subsequent testimony, is that she had stopped at Starbucks in Pasadena the night before last. When she came back out to her rented Ford Focus, there was a gang of skateboard kids near the car laughing. Jody says one of the kids had a screwdriver and another dropped the rectangular piece of metal on the ground. The gang of kids took off on skateboards and Jody picked up the piece of metal. The metal piece was face down and whatever it was she tossed it into the back seat of her car and since the car started up okay, Jody simply continued her drive to Utah. June 6, 2008, Friday, Mesa, Arizona, 10.30 p.m. Totally unaware of the heinous slaughter that just occurred five days prior, Travis's roommate, Zach Billings, is with his fiancée in the house watching a movie when they hear a knock at the door. Billings opens the door to three friends of Travis who tell Billings that Travis has missed several appointments. They're worried about him and ask Zach if they can please check in on him. Travis's door is locked, so looking through a box of extra keys, Zach Billings finally finds the key to Travis's door. He goes upstairs, he unlocks the door, walks in and discovers Travis Alexander's corpse slumped and rotting in the shower. The entire bathroom and surrounding area are caked with red and rust-colored blood splatter. Frantic and miserable, Travis's friend Marie Mimi Hall calls 911 and the investigation begins. Travis's friends specifically mention Jody Arias as a possible suspect, stating that Alexander had said she was stalking him, hacking his Facebook account, and slashing his car's tires. In their search of Travis Alexander's home, police find his recently purchased digital camera damaged in the washing machine. Police forensics are able to recover the deleted images showing Arias and Alexander in sexually suggestive poses, taken at approximately 1.40 p.m. on June 4th. The final photograph of Travis Alexander alive, showing him in the shower, was taken at 5.29 p.m. that day. Photos taken moments later show Travis Alexander profusely bleeding on the bathroom floor. A bloody palm print was discovered along the wall in the hallway, which contained DNA from both Arias and Alexander. July 9, 2008, Jody Arias is indicted by a grand jury in Maricopa County, Arizona, for the first-degree murder of Travis Alexander. She's rested in the Wairika home of her grandparents on July 15, 2008, and extradited to Arizona on September 5th. She pleads not guilty on September 11, 2008. During this time, she gives several different accounts of her involvement in Alexander's death. In the trial that follows, Arias testifies she killed Travis Alexander in self-defense, but she does not convince the jury who find Jody Arias guilty of first-degree murder. April 13, 2015. Judge Sherry Stevens sentences Jody Arias to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. As of 2018, Arias is housed at the Arizona Department of Corrections, number 281129, which is located at the Arizona State Prison Complex, Perryville. Arias began her sentencing at the complex's maximum security Lumley unit, but at some point she'll have the possibility of being downgraded to the medium security level. This concludes our audio presentation of the Jody Arias Timeline, written and narrated by Brian Newberry. This program dedicated in loving memory of Travis Victor Alexander, born 28 July 1977, deceased 4 June 2008. Travis Alexander, rest in peace. This audio program was recorded at Project Wasabi Studios, Hollywood, California, 90028. For more free audio content, including non-fiction programs like the one you just heard, as well as classic TV show audio dramas, we invite you to visit us online at projectwasabi.com. On behalf of Project Wasabi, this is Brian Newberry saying thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.